Fun fact, are we really made of stardust? A new study proves it. The cosmos is also within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Well said by Carl Sagan, an American astronomer, planetary scientist, cosmologist, astrophysicist, astrobiologist, author and science communicator. Hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, carbon, oxygen and phosphorus is what makes up the stars. And guess what we are made of? The exact same elements are also the most common elements supporting life on Earth. In which case, I'm not sure if the globalists and climate change activists really know what they're doing, trying to eliminate carbon footprint. Anyways, everything we find on Earth, including us, the atoms are formed in the core of the stars. And when a supernova occurs, which is during the last evolutionary stage of a star, or when a white dwarf, those are the hot, tense remnants of long dead stars. So, it triggered into a runaway nuclear fusion, resulting in the cosmic dust that contains many of the elements that I just mentioned along with many others from the periodic table to spread across the cosmos. And since everything, right from the planets and the stars to the plants and us, we all comprise of the same interstellar dust and hydrogen gas called solar nebula. We have the same chemistry and in short, we are connected via quantum entanglement. Mark D'Antonio, the astronomer, said it well. Everything we are comes from everything we have been and everything we were made from. That makes us more alike than different. one indeed because we all are so connected and yet so disconnected on so many levels don't you think such an ironical situation we have here but anyways we are a part of the cosmos and what does it contain earth dozens of moon stars various planets sun and lots more so let's begin with the sun and how we are so misinformed about it. The farthest back we go to 1913, when agricultural scientists found that hay dried in direct sunlight fed to goats in indoor cages kept them from developing osteoporosis by increasing their assimilation of calcium. More and more grains and other food crops were found to do the same. This was two decades before vitamin D was isolated and named as vitamin D2 in 1932 and vitamin D3 in 1937. And as you know, chemists love to divide everything into categories. So the first one is calciferol, which is a fresh vitamin D2, which forms when you expose almost any vegetable product, including straw, to ultraviolet light. And the second one is coal calciferol, which is a fresh vitamin D3 form when you expose almost any animal product, including feces, to the ultraviolet light. On this note, I would love to give an account of a herbalist, Phyllis Light, who resides in Alabama in the southern part of the US and she was describing an instance where she went for her regular blood work at the clinic and found out that her cholesterol levels were too high. So the nurse recommended to stop consuming high fatty foods. And for her, that was bacon and eggs in her morning breakfast, as one of her favorite meals of the day. So she began her vitamin D supplementation. And lo and behold, after her second blood checkup, she noticed her vitamin D levels did not improve much and her ability to handle stress was also low. So irrespective of whatever her blood test displayed, she restarted her diet on bacon again. Because as I just mentioned earlier, 
Animals have vitamin D as a hormone stored in their fat in response to the sunlight. But same goes for us as well. And so you know that bacon is a full fat part of the pork along with equal amounts of proteins that actually helped getting her vitamin D levels up and strengthening her adrenals to handle the stress pretty well. There's a reason you might be able to recollect from your science class back in high school about the two zoological classifications. Plants being autotrophs, meaning they produce their own food, and heterotrophs that eat other living things for food. It so happens that we have recently started learning about a third group of classification called photoheterotrophs. That's a hybrid of the two already existing classifications that I just mentioned. This is a groundbreaking discovery made by researchers at the Columbia University Medical Center that photoheterotrophs can use light for energy but cannot use carbon dioxide like plants. And examples of species including certain worms, rodents and pigs. What happens is chlorophyll metabolites are taken up in their mitochondria thus enabling them to use sunlight for energy 35% faster and up to a 16 fold increase as far as the quantity is concerned. Did you realize what just happened here? We are talking about the uptake and use of sunlight in relation to the consumption of chlorophyll like green vegetables. Assuming that we too have this inbuilt capability to not just use glucose but sunlight as well for energy may very well not be so far-fetched after all. But one thing is confirmed. Sunlight isn't harmful to us. If anything, it's beyond beneficial. It's life-giving. Let's take a look at what's happening at the atomic level. As I explained you all about the structure of atoms in the previous episode, wherein the protons, which is close to the nucleus, has a positive charge and the electrons in the shell um, orbit having a negative charge. In short, we are talking about electrical charge. We are connected with the earth and the cosmos, including the sun and its rays. The sun is a cathode ray, earth is an anode. When cathode comes in contact with an anode, free electrons are generated. Provided we are connected to the earth like leather shoes or barefoot, our human battery gets recharged as well. In part, we also get vitamin D, but it's more than that because our body absorbs different wavelengths of sunlight since every atom absorbs light as well, not just emits it. I don't want to waver away from today's topic, so there'll be a standalone episode covering these topics individually since they are really, really interesting and important considering our destination. So we need light water and magnetism to recharge our batteries basically to power the function at the cellular level and way beyond that which we are in the process of uncovering ourselves and piecing this puzzle together to see the bigger picture of true wellness. So when we are running out of charge because we are disconnected or we don't have a connection with these three important elements for life but when you're living more connected to the earth and sun, having sufficient exposure to the sun, basically sufficient light, like around the equator, you can live off the photosynthesis side of the battery, which is tied to water chemistry. And if we need to know the status of our battery health, our vitamin D status, you need to go into settings and press, ha, I was just kidding. We can check for tenderness in the tibial bone in the case of which we get to know that our DC electric current is bad, our vitamin D would be low. Why is that? An orthopedic surgeon Dr. Robert O. Becker figured out how bone physiology works and bone regeneration occurs by semiconduction in all mammals. And if you just expose your food to sunlight, you don't need any kind of supplementation as more than 400 IU a day can leach calcium out of the bone and into the tissues to calcify soft tissues, right? Also, combining calcium along with vitamin D can weaken your bones, create kidney stones and interfere 
with how your heart and brain works. It creates aggressive forms of polyps that are more likely to turn into colon cancer. In fact, when it comes to food, for example, just keep olive oil out of the bottle onto a surface for complete sun exposure around noon for 20 to 30 minutes to raise the vitamin D content and then store it in a brown glass bottle in a dark place but do not expose olive oil for more than 30 minutes because too much can destroy every trace of vitamin D. And also it has anti-rickets factor. Concludingly, we need sunlight and darkness to create vitamin D inside of us. Or even something as simple as like keeping your food under the sun during noontime for 5 to 10 minutes can greatly increase the vitamin D creation of the food. But you may ask that why is sunlight so much better than vitamin D supplementation? Because Sunlight stimulates neuroendocrine and immune system functions that are independent of vitamin D production or plasma levels, as quoted by Dr. Popper from one of her several related studies. In the past, in downtown areas of New York City, some groups of foreigners were still used to making spaghetti at home, using dough made from flour and water, and sometimes with eggs. And the dough was rolled out into spaghetti or noodles, which were then hung on broom handles on fire escapes to dry. These fire escapes were often full of spaghetti and noodles on sunny days. As the home industry grew, a marker for homemade noodles and spaghetti was established. However, fire ordinances were eventually put in place that prevented tenants from obstructing fire escapes, forcing them to dry their pasta indoors. A slew of complaints arose about the quality of the pasta, with some claiming a loss in the satisfying quality, which could only be partly compensated for by increasing the amount eaten, or in modern words, excessive carb consumption. Many consumers turned to imported spaghetti, which was mostly dried in open sunlight areas. It was later discovered by Harry Steenbock that the change in drying method was likely responsible for the loss in nutritive value, as flour could lose its ability to produce growth if not treated properly. But exposure to sunlight or ultraviolet radiation could restore their ability. Interestingly noted by Glenville Johns and L.J. Makin, vitamin D from skin or dietary sources does not circulate for long in the bloodstream, but instead is immediately taken up by adipose tissue or liver for storage or activation. In humans, tissue storage of vitamin D can last for months or even years. According to Pam Popper, it is becoming increasingly clear that in many, if not most cases, low vitamin D levels are the result of illness and not the cause. This is a very important distinction and it explains why so many intervention studies where patients have been given vitamin D as a supplement didn't really show much result which just happened with Phyllis as I mentioned earlier. What are we discussing here is lower vitamin D levels are caused by diabetes, infectious diseases, cardiovascular diseases, weight gain, multiple sclerosis, declining cognitive function and all kinds of conditions. These diseases are not caused by vitamin D deficiency, rather the reverse. Some facts I could add here in relation to what you just mentioned. So, UV light is known to activate solitrol, a skin-derived hormone of sunshine. And solitrol influences all our vital systems, including the immune system, along with its partner, melatonin. Imagine how powerful its influence is over us that it can also cause changes in mood 
and daily biological rhythms. Not only that, the hemoglobin in our red blood cells also require ultraviolet UV light from the sun in order to bind to oxygen. So yeah, lack of sunlight is also a factor involved in any kind of illness, including skin cancer and other forms of cancer. There are also interesting studies that were done in relation to sunlight. One of the studies published in the Journal of Psychosomatic Medicine, wherein patients undergoing spinal surgery were divided in two groups. One group stayed in the room of the hospital that were brightly lit with sunlight and the opposite for the other group. And the patients who had exposure to 46% higher intensity of natural sunlight during the hospital recovery period experienced less perceived stress, less pain and decreased analgesic use, example pain medications. Also, prolonged exposure to direct sunlight can kill many types of bacteria, viruses and other harmful substances. An example of this is Neisseria gonorrhea, which can die in the open air after several hours of sunlight exposure. The same is true for many other pathogenic bacteria. It is noteworthy that germicidal wavelength of UV light from the sun can even kill bacteria that have passed through the window glass. So, hospital wards that receive sunlight have fewer bacteria compared to the darker wards. Another study that was published in the journal Behavioral Neuroscience and it was concluded that subjects that were exposed to 6 hours of sunlight felt more alert and less sleepy in the evening compared to those exposed to artificial light. One last study from the journal, Medical Hypothesis, summarized how solar cycles directly influenced our genes, including lifespan. Yes, and it's also worth noting that individuals who spend the majority of their day working indoors are more susceptible to melanoma. This observation challenges the notion that an increase in UV exposure directly leads to an increase in melanoma cases. Additionally, there is a notable discrepancy in that cancerous growths can appear in areas of the body that are typically not exposed to the sun, including the eyes, rectum, vulva, vagina, mouth, respiratory tract, GI tract, and the bladder. Can you swim for more than 5 hours straight and not feel tired, fatigued or overwhelmed? Maybe get a little swollen? Or by mistake, place your finger near the stove and it's time before you realize that you have burned your finger. Or maybe overexpose yourself to rainwater and don't dry yourself up immediately can also give you an instant cold by draining your immune system. Okay, what about this? Sometimes when you overeat, don't you feel pukish later on? That means if we are over exceeding our body's limit to protect us, we are definitely up for harming ourselves. And who on earth would want to do that? Similarly, if we expose ourselves to the sun and burn holes into our skin. Hey, you know, we have got a super intelligent body. It will let us know before that happens. And especially when you are an eater of substandard quality, rancid oils, you will get to know even faster. So, don't blame the sun, blame yourself. An axiom that holds true in my mind. And with that, we come to an end. Of today's episode. If you like what we do and would like to be a part of it, you can consider becoming a patron and enjoy some of the benefits that come along with it. All links are given in the show notes and for any additional inquiries, contact us by visiting our website befit1.com. So let's wrap this up with what Dr. Orgay said. Just as the sun is the principle of all life, so it is a source of all healing. It is the sun and uniquely the sun that sick people seek in winter on our coast.
It is the great doctor, doctor of the faculty of the sky, to whom the suffering come to demand a cure for their ills. <laughs>